This is a reading from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 27 through 36. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? So Jesus said to him, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Father, this is a season of the lights that we see around us in our neighborhoods and on our tree. We pray, Lord, that we would see clearly the light that is truly among us in Jesus Christ. Open our ears to your truth and our hearts so that we may understand the truth and believe. It's Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism, the catechism for our, our faith, for our denomination, it starts out with this very first question, which says, what is the chief end of man, meaning what is God's ultimate, what is the ultimate purpose and destiny of, of mankind? Uh, and you reformed catechized kids out there, I don't know the answer to this. The answer to that question is that we would glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, what does that that even mean? What does glorify mean? It's not a word we use a whole lot outside of sporting events. Uh, So in the ancient ancient world, glory meant a certain weight or reverence or awe that was placed around someone's name. And the Hebrew word for glory literally means like heavy or weighty. Uh, It's a great way to describe it. The, the, The dictionary definition is actually pretty good. It says, to glorify something is to make known the striking beauty and splendor of someone or something that then evokes feelings of delighted admiration and awe. That's a pretty good definition of what glory is. And what does it mean to enjoy God? It means that we are, uh, we are, we delight in knowing him, knowing who he is and understanding the immensity of his being and delighting in and enjoying in in his blessings and and his benefits that he pours out for his people. So that's what those two things mean individually. What's not so obvious, but begins to emerge through the thick mist of our sinful and fallen intellects as we study this stuff, is that these two ideas are interrelated. They're locked together. Uh, Somehow, God is glorified through our enjoyment of him. Somehow, God is brought glory. God is shown to be strikingly beautiful and full of splendor in a way that evokes delighted admiration in us through our knowing him, through our receiving blessing and benefit from him. Those two things work right together and the same idea is really hidden is the core meaning of the passage that we just read 
Somehow God is about to be shown forth to the world in striking beauty and splendor that should evoke delighted admiration and awe. And that glory is going to come through a very unlikely or or unpredictable source. As we read this, it becomes clear that what Jesus is talking about is the, the brutal crucifixion death that he's about to suffer. And so what they're saying is that God the Father will be glorified by the death of his son. Or more specifically, what the death of his son accomplishes. If you read through John's gospel and you pay attention, you see that whenever Jesus performs miracles, whenever he does something uh, with his power, he usually is trying to stay in the shadows. He tells people, don't tell anyone what I've done. The world is not, we're not ready to reveal yet. And so he says throughout the gospel from the miracle of the wine at the wedding of Cana all throughout the rest of the gospel, he keeps saying, my hour has not come. My hour has not come. And here for the first time, we see and hear him publicly acknowledging what he just put on vivid display in the triumphal entry as he came into Jerusalem on a colt, making known to everyone in the most explicit way that the Jews would understand that he, in fact, was the Messiah. And now he acknowledges that his hour had finally come. And as it turns out, that hour has been a pretty time-specific statement the whole time not just a metaphorical analogy for a period of time. He is literally talking about the hour of his death. The purpose for what Jesus has come for to accomplish is to glorify the Father, and he is going to glorify the Father through his sacrificial death. And so Jesus' death accomplishes at least three things that he lays out here that brings glory to the Father through the blessing and benefit of his people. And the first one is that the Father is glorified through the judgment of the world. The Father is glorified through the judgment of the world. Now I realize this is Christmas Eve and Advent and we're supposed to be talking about chubby angels and uh, we're not supposed to be talking about judgment. <laughs> Uh, but Jesus is talking about judgment. He says straight up, now is the judgment of this world, and it's going to bring glory to God. Now, you would be hard-pressed, I would wager, hard-pressed to find a religious idea that is more offensive to regular people than the idea of the judgmental God. I had a, a mentor, one of my, well, one of my early mentors in, in AA when I was uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, who used to say things like, you know, he used to talk about his, his understanding of God, and he would say that he soon came to the realization, I realized that the idea of a judgmental God just wasn't going to work for me. In other words, he felt completely free to cast that aside. Translation, since I, the creature, get to decide who God is and what he's like and what he should expect from me, I'd prefer to imagine a version of God that allows me to set my own moral standards, that allows me to do whatever I want to do, that allows me to choose what's right and what's wrong, irregardless of the trail of destruction that I leave in my path, right? Now, AA is not a hotbed of, uh, it's not really known for people who have made good moral judgments in their life. So it's rather amazing that we would come to that conclusion, and yet so many people do. And Jesus says, reality check. Not only does God make moral judgments, God promises to enforce those moral judgments. Uh, and not only that, Jesus is saying, the Father is glorified through making and enforcing those moral judgments. Uh, and we say to that, what? 
how can that possibly be? If you're not a Christian, you're probably thinking, how is it possible that God could be glorified through something as morally repugnant as the idea of a judgmental God? How could striking beauty and splendor that evokes feelings of delighted admiration in me come from the thought of God judging the world? Mm, it, it is difficult. Well, Jesus is talking about a couple of things. First, he's talking about the judgment of the world now. He says, now is the judgment of the world, meaning after the cross, the world enters into a period of judgment where now all judgment of all men everywhere is based on one single standard. The response to the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the finished work of Jesus as the offer of salvation to all people. It's not about what you do. It's not about how good you are. It's not about your good works undoing your bad works, as we learned this week watching Home Alone 2. The sole standard for judgment is how do you respond to the message of the gospel? Do you believe it? Do you reject it? If you believe it, God promises life and peace. If you reject it, God promises that you remain in the condemnation that you are already in. It's very serious stuff. We think about the gospel uh, in the terms of just all light and all blessing, but the gospel is a form of judgment going out into the world. When we share the gospel with people, there's only two possible outcomes. Belief, reject. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. And as that gospel message goes out, along with it, we see a temporary judgment upon mankind that is in itself an act of mercy from God. Now, as we as Christians, we see these sweeping you know, victories of evil overtaking our, our culture. We see vast swaths of people like believing that the light is dark and the dark is light and fighting and championing evil and destruction, believing that what they're championing is goodness and light and truth. And we see the, the terrible consequences coming out of that Sometimes we as Christians and as the church, we're tempted to be afraid or we're tempted to be, um, to be scared, like what is happening? What we don't realize is what the Bible says is that those victories are, in fact, the current judgment of God. When the Bible talks about the wrath of God coming upon the creatures of the earth, he's talking about God giving over people to the desires of their heart so that they can then experience the consequences of practicing evil and believing that the light is darkness in, uh, as, uh, in the hopes of bringing repentance. He, it, it, he allows these merciful, these measured doses of merciful destruction in the hopes that people will come to their senses and repent and believe in the light that he freely offers. And so in, even in that we see that God allowing people to suffer the consequences of their sin is an act of mercy that glorifies God. Well, the sad reality, of course, is that there is coming a judgment of the world then, not a judgment of the world now. The sad reality is, and this is proven over and over and over again in history, uh, that people cause massive suffering in the world through their sin, individually towards one another, corporately, uh, in nation against nation, corporation against corporation, people against people. Sinful people cause sin and suffering and evil in the world and then turn around and curse God for the destruction that we have brought into the world and reject God 
in favor of their own versions of God. And after millennia of merciful blessing and benefit, giving to the good and to the evil, and the offer of salvation gone out to all people everywhere. God has the moral right to cleanse his creation. God has the moral right to bring cleaning and purification and to cleanse his creation of the evil that brings so much suffering and for the benefit of his people. Now that's really bad news if you believe that darkness is light. But it's really good news if in Christ you are able to see what is light and what is dark. You know, there's all kinds of like temporary crises facing us as a nation right now. It was, as a border state, we're very concerned about the cartels across the border. We're concerned about the fentanyl epidemic. We're concerned about 80,000 people dying and overdosing from drugs this year. I don't think any of us would be morally outraged if the government was able to step in and shut down the cartels. It was able to shut down the drug trade and save people from that horrible fate. And that would be bringing a moral judgment. That would be acting and enforcing upon that moral judgment and eradicating evil. And God has the same right to do the same thing on a cosmic level. That's what judgment is. God bringing justice to his creation. And if you think about it, we all pray for that. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, thy kingdom come. And so when God finally brings justice to rebellious creatures who dare to make moral judgments against the creator, call the creator darkness, uh, and, cre and when he creates a new world of beauty and light for his people... God will be glorified in that. And God is being glorified in that. Second thing God is glorified in is that Jesus says God is glorified in his victory over Satan. God is glorified in his victory over Satan. A bit of a theological controversy here over what seems to be a possible contradiction. Maybe you can pick this up. On the one hand... Jesus says that Satan has already been defeated. He says things like, Satan has been bound for a thousand years. He talks about uh, now the ruler of this world in this passage has been cast out. And yet some of the other writers of the New Testament, Peter says things like, the devil is like a prowling lion who's like roving around the outskirts of the church waiting to pick off the Christians that isolate themselves from the body. John says that our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil are very active in the world. They're in the New Testament, talks about how the devil is a huge threat. How can those both be true? Uh, you know, Jesus is the boss, right? So his interpretation gets precedence. If Jesus says the devil's being cast out, if Jesus says that Satan is bound, the angels of the dark angels are bound, uh, then you got to believe that. And yet, if you're a person, if you're like a human being on the ground, if you're a Christian, let's get real for a minute. If you're a Christian <laughs> and you're in it, uh, you got to face the reality that Satan is kicking our backsides. Can I get an amen? How do we reconcile these things together? Paul comes to the rescue for us in Colossians chapter 2 where he says, he says this about Jesus, what happened on the cross and the outcome. He says this, and you, talking about us, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. 
This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. So what does that say? It says that Satan has a weapon, and that weapon is a weapon that he uses against us. What is the weapon? The weapon is the law. And the weapon is our moral debt to the law. The weapon is our sin. The picture is Satan in the heavenly councils. You don't remember the book of Job in the beginning of the book of Job, right? Job didn't have the privilege of reading chapters one and two. So he really had no idea what was going on. But in chapters one and two of the book of Job, we see Satan in the assembly of God, in the heavenly court, condemning Job, saying he's a sinner just like everybody else. Take away, the, take away your blessings and he'll curse you to your face. That's what Satan did. He would be in the court of heaven and he would say to God, your law says that they must die for their sins. You have to judge them. You don't have a choice. You have to judge them. And so what did Jesus do? How did he disarm Satan? How did he take that weapon away from him? It says he nailed it to the cross. Who was nailed to the cross? Jesus was nailed to the cross, and in him, being nailed to the cross, we were judged for our sin. Jesus took the judgment of our sin upon himself, was nailed to the cross, took our sin into death, and left it there. Resurrected into, the, into life, giving us new life so that Satan no longer had that weapon to use against us. And so here's the thing. When Jesus says, now the ruler of this world is cast out, we think because he says world, it means cast out of the world. No, nah, that's not what he means. He is saying now the ruler of this world has been cast out of the heavenly court. Jesus says in Luke, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He no longer has a weapon. He no longer has a case in the heavenly court. Our sin has been taken away. Which means what? It means that we, if Jesus has already been judged for our sin, what does that mean? It means that you cannot be judged for your sin. It's already been dealt with. You cannot be judged for your sin because Jesus has already been judged in your place. It would be unjust of God to judge you for sins that have already been judged and dealt with in Jesus. And so our salvation uh, is really rooted in and based in and has a foundation in the integrity of God who cannot lie, who cannot sin, who cannot act in unjustly. Which means that for Christians, for those who are trusting in Jesus, uh, judgment day is a thing of the past. It happened back there. When we think about, if you are a Christian and you're concerned about dying and facing God on the judgment seat, you can put that to rest. For Christians, judgment day is a thing of the past because God became one of us and lived a perfect and sinless life and died for the penalty of our sins, took the penalty of his own cosmic justice upon himself and was judged in our place so that we would never, ever have to fear judgment again. If you have believed in Jesus, you have eternal life. The old is gone, the new has come. You are part of the new creation. Well, why is that important for this? You know, there's a lot of religious ideals and a lot of different religions of the world who present their image of God, their imaginations of God in beautiful ways. The God that has all power of Islam. The God who is of absolute moral perfection and demands the same. The God who is magnificent. Uh, the God 
who is an extension or the God who creation is an extension of his being and character so that all is part of God and all is one and one is all. All of those images of God are images that are imaginary gods created by our fallen imaginations as we want God to be. The God who demands moral perfection allows us to present ourselves as morally perfect and to fool ourselves that we are. So it's all about us. And the God, and the version of God, the imaginary God that uh, is in all and through all as part of his creation allows us to be God, allows us to be a part of God. These are all conceptions of God from the fallen imagination of how we want God to be, but none of them, none of them come close to the image of God as he is presented in the Bible, as a God that is all-powerful, as a God that is uh, transcendent and beyond us, beyond our imagination's capacity to see who he is, and yet at the same time, he is imminent in the world with us, and yet he's not a God that stands aloof and distant from us, he's a God who has come to us and has entered into our suffering, a God who has not asked us to die for him, but a God who has come and died for us and taken his own judgment upon himself so that we could be with him forever. Uh, he is the only conception of God that takes the annihilation upon himself to shield his people, to give them eternal life, to defeat the satanic powers of force and moral perfection and the demands of the law with the greater power of sacrificial love and grace. He shows his heart to be humble and lowly and sacrificial and loving and willing to roll up his sleeves and get in the mud to save us. And I don't know about you, but that version of God is so much more beautiful and so much more splendorous in such a way that it should and it does evoke feelings of delighted, astonished admiration and joy. And so first, God is glorified by judging and eradicating the pestilence of evil, ruining his creation and recreating it into glory for his people. And he is glorified in that. Two, God is glorified by disarming and casting out the leader of the rebellion and bringing life to his people. And three, third, God is glorified by accomplishing the redemption of his people, by accomplishing the redemption of his people. If all the last part that I just said is true about how God has taken the judgment upon himself, that we have been judged in Christ, that judgment day is a thing of the past, that that's an accomplished fact, if Jesus was judged for our sin in such a way that we can never be judged for them again and never face judgment again on the last day, what that means necessarily is that Jesus didn't come just to make a salvation possible for people. It means that he actually accomplished salvation for his people, for us. And that's an important Distinction, And there's another little theological controversy along those lines. If you look at verse 32 in this passage, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, John likes to depict the cross as Jesus being lifted up on a throne, as the cross as the altar of God, where Jesus as high priest sacrifices himself, as the once for all offering for sin. And so he talks about being lifted up, exalted, glorified on the cross. He says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And he showed this. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And if you've been paying attention last week, 
We said this, Jesus said, that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, same word, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, if you put those two things together, here's what you get. It seems to say, no one can come to the Father unless the, he is drawn. Everyone drawn by the Father will be raised on the last day. And three, Jesus is saying his sacrificial death will draw all people. And you put that together, it means to say that all people are going to be drawn, all people will come to Jesus, and all people will be raised into glory on the last day. And uh, let me be first before I say the next thing, be ultra, ultra, ultra clear. The offer of the gospel is a legitimate and genuine awful offer that goes out to all people everywhere. Uh, everyone, is in, everyone is invited, everyone is given, everyone is given the gospel. People don't come because they're unwilling, not because they're not invited. Uh, and so here's the problem. What's the problem is? The problem with what we just, all putting all those pieces together is that experientially and in the Bible we see not all people are drawn If we take that to mean that Jesus will draw all people, or God will draw all people to Jesus, all people will be lifted up on the la raised on the last day, that contradicts everything where the Bible says not all people will come to Jesus. It contradicts our experience where not all people will come to Jesus. In fact, most are repulsed, most are offended. To most, Christ is the aroma of death. They get close to the spirit and, and, and they, they start to subconsciously realize their own condemnation and judgment and do everything in their power to suppress that truth and push it as far away from them as they can with these ornate imaginary depictions of God that allows you to do whatever you want. Most people are unwilling. Most people love darkness and do not come to Christ. How do we solve that? Well, the solution is, is, the solution is this. When Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself, the word people is added by the translators. It's not in the Greek. What it says is that when I am lifted up, I will draw all to myself. So the question is, who are the all? Could be all people. Uh, could be all anything. Could be, could be all anything. And so how do we sort out? How do we understand who the all are? And the answer is to interpret the Bible with the Bible. Where else does Jesus talk about the all? And who are they? We see above what we've just read that the all are those drawn by the Father to the Son. Very same word. We see in John 10 that the all are Jesus' sheep. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I must bring them. They will listen to my voice. And then he looks at the Pharisees and says, the reason you don't believe is because you are not my sheep. So there is all Jesus' sheep and not Jesus' sheep. And finally, the all is all that the Father gives in verse chapter 10, all the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. In John 17, Jesus praying to the Father, he says, I, the Son, I give eternal life to all whom you have given me. And so who's the all? The all is those drawn by the Father, all drawn by the Father. The all are all of Jesus' sheep. The all are all that the Father gives to Jesus. 
Now, this is very deep and very heavy. So it's good to make it as simple as possible. Here's the big picture. The picture we see from a world that has come under judgment is that there is a world that loves darkness, a world that hates God, a world that naturally is repulsed and offended by the thing of God, things of God, a world that loves to worship itself, to create fanciful imagination, imaginary versions of God that allow us to worship ourselves, that allow us to do whatever we want to do, which is evil, which creates suffering in the world. Every man and woman and child ever born naturally rejects the light of Christ. Two, out of that whole of people who have rejected God and hate God, God has chosen to redeem some. God has chosen to redeem all who he is drawing to himself, all of Jesus' sheep, all that he has chosen to give to the Son. And he does that by paying the cosmic debt owed for our sin with his own life, with his own blood, accomplishing our salvation. It's a done deal. Sometimes I like to trick people and I say, when were you saved? And they'll be like, oh, I was, um, you know, I had a Bible in, the, in, a, in county jail and we started reading it. Or I was, you know, at youth camp and I really came to understand, you know, and I was like, no, you were saved somewhere on or around April 3rd, 33 AD, outside the gates of Jerusalem, when Christ died on the cross, accomplishing your salvation for you. The Holy Spirit then applied that salvation to your life at that certain time. But you were saved at the cross. It's a done deal. And that's how this passage shows that the glorifying of God and our enjoyment of him forever are interrelated. To put it real simple, how is God glorified? God is glorified by saving us. It brings him glory to be known for how he really is, what he's really like, his mercy, his long suffering, his patience, his lowliness of heart the beauty of his moral character, of, of seeing a world of rebellious creatures and choosing to save some from among the whole for his own, which is us, if you believe in Jesus. And that should evoke feelings of delighted admiration and reverence and awe. So let me conclude with this. A lot of people hear things like that, and the initial question is like, oh, so what does that mean? Does that mean everything's set? My, my, my future is set? Everyone's fate is sealed? No. In the next breath, Jesus says and calls everyone to believe in the light while the light is still shining. Which for us means until Jesus returns. Today is the day of salvation. Everyone is freely offered to believe and to come into the light. Well, here's the scary part. Scary part is if you noticed and you paid attention to the story, Jesus prays to the Father. He says, Father, glorify your name. And the Father responds out loud. And says, I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. Maybe that he probably means either that he's just, he's glorified in the life of Jesus. Now he's about to be glorified by the death of Jesus. Maybe it means he just glorified himself by raising Lazarus from the dead. And he's about to glorify it again in the same way, but bigger through Jesus. Either way, he answers out loud. And what happens? Some of the people say... Hear it. Some of the people hear it. Voice of an angel. They hear what God says. Some of the people, they say, ah, that was just thunder. You guys are tripping. No, we heard the voice from heaven. No, that was, you guys are tripping. That was thunder. Get over it. 
two responses. And that's pretty much how this works. See, um, I know that we have been raised from birth to believe uh, that your rational mind and powers of reasons are your primary tools for discerning spiritual truth. The Bible says those are of no value to you without faith. Those tools are great for understanding what God has said. They are terrible tools to determine if God has said because your sin will take over and you'll exalt and glorify yourself. Some of you have heard this message right now. And it sounded like thunder. Just some random pastor blustering nonsense. Whether you're watching online, maybe you're here visiting today. If that's true... At this point in time, at least, there's not a lot we can do to help you. You can pray, and I would encourage you to pray, but you probably won't. The seed have been cast into your heart, and the ravens have already come and taken it away. But maybe a few of you have heard it. Maybe you've really heard what's just been said about God and his character and the judgment of the world and the liberation and the offer of, sal- of, of salvation from the judgment of the world. Maybe you j- you've heard it. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you don't know what to do with it. But you know what you know now and the burr is under your saddle if that's you, man, will we encourage you to pray. Pray, pray. You cannot think your way into the kingdom. You can pray your way into the kingdom. Pray that God would reveal himself to you. Pray that you would be able to know who he really is. Ask God to show him who he really is and he will show you his glory in such a way that will evoke astonished, delighted admiration and joy and give you the opportunity to enjoy him forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we all, at least to a certain degree, suffer from a theological big man syndrome, meaning we tend to think of you as a big, powerful man in the sky or a human. We think that you are like us or somehow a bigger, better version of us, but you are wholly different from us. We tend to all put ourselves in your place and pretend that we are the little gods of our own lives. Even though we are dependent upon you for every single breath we take and every second of our existence depends upon you holding together the elements of the subatomic world together with your power. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see how you are glorified in all of these things, to place all of our hope in a new and perfect creation that you will bring to us to place all our hope in knowing that you will you will restore the world you will remove evil in all of its forms and all of the sadness and suffering and pain that we have experienced here at the hands of others and that others have experienced at our hands will be a thing of the past a thing of the distant past we pray that you would help us to understand that as Christians we have already been judged And we are secure in your election of us. You will not let us go. We cannot wiggle our way out. That you will keep us and protect us until that day when you come again to bring us into glory, into your glory. And for those who don't know you, Father, I pray that you would, that they would pray and that you would reveal yourself to them in all of the beautiful glory and splendor that you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please stand and let's sing as we approach the Lord's table.